Hi, everyone. Um, we've now got everyone online, both of our participants. So we'll start now. Um, sorry about the slight delay. Um, and sorry, I think, Rodney, unfortunately, you're under my name because I shared the link. So that's the joy of a weird technical glitch. There's always one and this had to be it. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so I'll start by introducing myself. My name's Rebecca Santos and I'm an advisor here with the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation at the OECD. And I'm managing the public consultation process for the um, uh, draft declaration on the um, uh, draft declaration on public sector innovation. Um, so I thought today could be a fairly informal discussion where we could commence by talking to two countries, um, France and Canada, about their experiences with declarations, um, how they came about in their specific contexts and how they've used them so far to spur innovation action. Um, I'll then turn to my colleague, Alex Roberts, an analyst here in our team, um, to talk about some of the ideas underpinning the declaration and why we think this could be a useful thing for countries um, going forward. And then I'll conclude the session by talking about um, what I've been seeing so far in some of the responses I've been getting through the public consultation process and just giving some handy hints and some advice about what kind of responses we'd really love to see from all of you as you're submitting your ideas through the consultation. Um, so that's the structure. And in just in terms of uh, housekeeping, it would be really great if people had questions, if they could just type them into the Zoom webinar chat um, and I'll repeat the question and answer it um, perhaps as we go or perhaps at the conclusion of each little um, section of it. So uh, yeah, that's how we'll run this one today. Um, so I'd like to invite Rodney from Canada um, to speak first about his experience creating a declaration and um, how it's been used so far. And we're just really interested in your experience with this kind of document. So the Great. floor's over to you. Thanks, Rebecca. So can you hear me okay now? I can hear you, yes. Excellent. Great. So um, so thanks. Really pleased to be here today to talk about our experience uh, in having a declaration on public sector innovation, which has been in place now for a couple of years. Uh, and I'm really excited with the work that the OECD is doing to, to take um, this concept uh, at a global level. So. Just to give you a bit of backstory in terms of how we set up our uh, declaration on public sector innovation. So this started back in 2015 um, when all of the uh, heads of the public services here in Canada, and so just to kind of situate yourself, uh, Canada has a federated model of governance. So we have a federal government uh, that works in conjunction with provincial and territorial governments. Uh, so we have sort of two levels of public services. All the heads of the public services, so 14 in all, get together sort of on a quarterly basis and talk about issues of common sort of governance from a public sector standpoint. So these are non-political discussions. And it was in uh, 2015 that the discussions really started turning towards kind of the renewal of the public service and looking at the public service as, you know, sort of a huge enterprise across the country, one that needs to really sort of keep pace with what we're seeing sort of outside of the public sector, one that needs to transform itself and really sort of stay relevant towards uh, the citizens that we serve. And what is uh, obviously apparent for anyone, I think, kind of working in the public services, that doesn't matter what level of government you're working in, we're all serving the same citizens. And at some level, we all sort of have some of the same challenges in terms of, you know, how do we use data in different ways? How do we use digital technologies in a more impactful way? How do we engage Canadians and our citizens in a way where we can kind of co-create and co-design um, solutions to the problems that we're all kind of facing right now? And so over a couple of years, uh, all of the heads of the public services started having these annual uh, sort of gatherings of public sector innovation. We bring in sort of individuals to help sort of spur, I think, kind of new thinking and new ideas. And then we started coalescing around this idea of a declaration. And so the idea of a declaration, which is non-binding kind of in nature, but it's really about sending a signal across all of the systems to say, you know, all of the heads of the public services really care about these issues. They really care about trying sort of new things taking sort of these so-called risks, uh, testing things out, sort of recognizing things won't always work. But at the end of the day, the reason why we're doing this is to ensure that we're delivering better policies and programs to our citizens. 
And so over the course of, I guess, the early part of 2017, we drafted up this declaration that I think uh, you, you can certainly find online um, if you just uh, sort of Google that. Happy to send out sort of the, um, uh, the link to all the participants kind of afterwards. And we put together sort of this high level sort of aspirational kind of statement uh, that is codifying all of the things that I kind of just talked about in terms of new partnerships, new data, sort of new technology, new funding models, all of that. And the idea, um, I think that was really sort of at the heart of, um, you know, the minds of all of our heads of uh, public services was recognizing that sort of when you look at the entire enterprise of the public service. So uh, federally, um, we have around 250,000 employees. If you look at sort of all the provincial levels, you're getting up to say 700,000 sort of public sector employees across the country. It's really hard to penetrate uh, across all of those layers of the public service in a way that will resonate with everyone and that they will see sort of their leaders wanting them to do these types of um, sort of new and transformative ideas. And so we've been using the, the declaration and it was signed, so it was signed in November of 2017. It's actually the first time that we had all of our heads of public services sign on to something together um, uh, in the history of sort of the clerks and cabinet secretaries, those are the heads of the public service. We've been using it over the last couple of years really as a signpost. And so pointing to it as sort of new policies have been developed, uh, new programs kind of implemented to kind of point to sort of decision makers that don't necessarily have a line of sight that uh, say I would have in my day-to-day -day work or others would have uh, to say that, you know what, you're given agency, you're given license to do these types of things. You're empowered to do that. Your senior leaders are asking you to do that. And so we want you to, uh, um, we want you to take sort of the, those bold sort of ideas and see if you can make them work for, for a better outcome in the end. The other thing that we're really using it for too is to help us kind of engage with our provincial and territorial colleagues in a more meaningful way. And so thinking about sort of all of the issues that we uh, sort of face within the public, in the federal, at the federal level, we now have this declaration that is helping us sort of start up new and different kind of discussions with our provincial and territorial colleagues to say, what if we actually try some of these new ideas together? And so once again, in that spirit of kind of de-risking, the more people you have around the table, the more sort of great ideas that kind of come to fruition. Um, and the more that I think we feel a bit sort of um, sort of bolder and kind of safer in numbers. And so that's, that's the, the history of where uh, the declaration uh, kind of came from and, and where we're at now and, and how we're sort of using it on, um, I would say, sort of a day-to-day -day basis. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that, Rodney. I really appreciate your time, especially because I know you have a snowstorm to contend with this morning in Canada. Um, uh, I'd like now to invite Benoit. Um, who can speak from the French perspective um, about his creation of a manifesto um, and how French uh, civil servants, public servants are using the document um, in their day-to-day -day work. So the, the floor is yours now, Benoit. Yeah. Um, thanks, Rebecca. And hi, everyone. So um, first, to, so I'm going to, t to tell you about this so uh, what we call the French Manifesto for Public Sector Innovation, uh, which we released in March 2017. So why? Um, when I think the first thing is that we saw here uh, in our department a growing interest for innovation uh, in French administration uh, in the year 2016, so before we wrote this. And uh, one of the big examples of this was the creation of a new generation of public labs in uh, most uh, French regions. So it was really new and going stronger. So, uh, and we heard and we saw a kind of expectation to define what is public sector innovation in the context of French uh, public administration. So uh, expectation for definition and for guidelines. Uh, because uh, many new public servants were discovering this. They didn't know what was a lab, what was a design, what was experimentation. So, and they asked us on the national level to give guidelines based on our experience of what works, what doesn't work. And, uh, and so we, we took it as, uh, uh, it became like a goal for us here in the beginning of this uh, year 2017 to write this and 
like to also to give these guidelines in um, in this kind of fashion time for public sector innovation here because we wanted to make this not just a fashion uh, but a serious thing so uh, to to we had to explain um, and to argue to give arguments that it can give uh, serious results if you do it in a white way it's uh, like not just innovation for innovation just uh, don't do uh, just an event with post-it it's useless uh, but uh, i like if you i can do say things like this um he, like he, if you how could i say um if you do it like uh, in a serious way when you if you take time and if you do it for good reasons and for a specific goal like uh, what we say it's like a new approach to public policy making uh, it can have a big impact on your policy and in government in general. And so we released this document, it's like uh, six pages like this, in uh, an event we organized uh, in March 2017. Um, and also, uh, I, you, you asked me, um, how, what did um, this manifesto allow the government to do? Um, and I think the first, like the most obvious result, and we have a, a other results came after, but the first one is just that it gave a text, a common reference, um, and it gave something to rely on, like something to show. And for example, when our digital minister, uh, Munir Majoubi, came at OECD conference like a year and a half ago, uh, he used this and he showed this uh, on stage saying, this is our vision of uh, what uh, public sector innovation should be, of how governments should act now in this uh, new transformation time to be more efficient. And so it can seem to be like a small thing, but um, we had nothing before. We didn't have uh, this kind of uh, reference text of uh, official or national guidelines uh, to define and to, to promote public sector innovation. And um, for public servants also, it spread more like a viral thing uh, in our community of what we call public sector innovators. Um, because for many of them, we are like uh, discovering or delivering their first projects like uh, of design or experiment or behavioral sciences or this kind of methods. It gave them, uh, many of them, like a basis and also some legitimacy to to go to see their boss and to say um, what I'm doing or what our team is doing is something serious. We are not like uh, crazy guys uh, having fun in a room. Uh, what we do is something that can have impact if you listen to us and if you give us more confidence watching what kind of results we've had so far. And uh, we used it a lot as like a, we could say a pillar or main tool in the development of this community of public innovators which is now like uh, six or seven hundred people now uh, because we when they come and they ask us uh, what is this community what do you do uh, what brings you together we often use this again to like a tool saying um, because we say it's like a community of vision a community of mindset because uh, the final goal is to change the culture of uh, French public sector administration. So we need this kind of text to have values, to have examples, to have principles, to have uh, common challenges also. Um, and that's, I think it's the, the most important uh, impact of this uh, manifesto thing is that it helped our community to grow and to have a common basis, uh, something like a vision together. I would say it's uh, the most important thing in the French context. Thank you so much, Benoit, for um, sharing your perspective. Um, I have seen on the chat, we've had a few questions. Um, so the first one was whether or not there's a way to access the manifesto uh, from France and the declaration from Canada. Uh, of course, um, what I'll do, you can find these independently through a Google search, but what I'll do after this webinar is I'll update the blog that people went to to click through to the registration platform with these examples so that they're all in one spot. And then I'll email the, the list of registrants of this webinar with a few helpful links and a summary of our conversation at the end of the day. 
Um, did people have any specific questions they wanted to type um, to either Benoit or Rodney for them to answer while we still have them online with us? Um, I'll just wait a second while I look to see if any messages are being typed so you can watch my thinking face while I do that. Um, okay, I don't think there's any um, messages coming through. So yeah, um, thank you so much, Benoit and Rodney, for sharing your experience and your time with us this afternoon. Um, oh, wait, somebody asked a question, sorry. Um, uh, we have a question about whether or not there were any backlashes to the, um, to the manifesto in France and perhaps Rodney, if you can share any experiences um, from Canada, um, were there any negative reactions to this document? Was there any pushback? Um, I'll, let, um, I'll let Benoit answer first because it was uh, directed specifically at the, um, at the French experience, but um, if people could talk to backlashes, backlashes or reactions or how different segments of the public sector reacted to this. So uh, let me just, yeah. um, uh, you go ahead, uh, Benoit, you're unmuted. Okay. Um, yeah, first, um, I have to say we had first some difficulties to get this endorsed by our boss, uh, to be honest. Uh, but when she read it for the second time, she said, okay, yeah, it's important. Uh, now is the time to deliver this. Because first she said, maybe it's too early. Are we really mature on this? Uh, so, and when we used the fact that we, have, we had this event like a month later and that uh, it was a good opportunity to deliver something strong and uh, this kind of uh, document and also um, i have to say it's maybe not a backlash but uh, two things first uh, we still have some like hostility or, uh, or how could i say um, not being taken seriously by many French, many people in government, in top uh, administration, top management, you know, because they don't know what it is or they don't think it's serious or they don't want to work a different way. So we are still like, even if we are growing, we are a growing minority in uh, French administration. Uh, and the third thing is that also, I have to be honest that um, this is not enough to transform our government. So, and so far, le, uh, like uh, Emmanuel Macron or the French Prime Minister haven't used it as a, um, like a, it's not a ma uh, something magical to like to transform your administration. So um, I could say it's like a step ahead and it helps uh, help us growing, but um, it helped uh, driving some political support but uh, it didn't give us a full impact that we could have because it's still in, in progress now, I could say. Okay, thank you, Benoit. Um, perhaps Rodney might have uh, some experience to share from Canada about how people reacted to the declaration. Was it all positive? Was it all negative? Was it somewhere in between? Um, if you had any thoughts you'd like to share, um, you have the floor now. Great, thank you, Rebecca. So I'm actually gonna, I think, echo a lot of the, the sentiments that Benoit expressed in terms of how sort of the French manifesto was received in his country. I think there's a lot of similarities to how sort of our declaration on public sector innovation was received here in Canada. So, so once again, this was, it was a document that was released to set out sort of these, this aspirational vision uh, and these high level goals for the public service. Um, it was received obviously well in certain circles. I think it was just acknowledged in others. I think, you know, what's interesting, uh, I think in what Benoit said too, in terms of the seriousness of the work and how is that sort of reflected on a day-to-day -day basis within the public sector. And so what I would say is that, um, you know, sort of in a similar way, we continue to make sort of gains within sort of here in Canada in terms of moving this idea of, um, trying out sort of, you know, new, different, transformative, bold ideas from sort of side of desk now into kind of center of desk. I think the, the declaration has helped uh, at some level um, sort of move that kind of forward, but I don't think we've made sort of all the gains that we need to make. And I think there's still a lot of issues around, I think, how people sort of perceive sort of innovation and experimentation within government. Um, 
And I think, you know, thinking about that as sort of a mainstream sort of like way of thinking and a paradigm shift of how we want to sort of move forward, I don't think is quite there yet. So, I mean, overall, I think the concept of innovation and experimentation is still sort of in its um, kind of infancy or adolescent phase. Um, I think the declaration here in Canada was something that was sort of a, as I mentioned before, kind of a guidepost kind of along the way. And so I think it was, I think it was acknowledged um, in either a positive or sort of neutral way. There was nothing sort of negative about the declaration in and of itself. Uh, I think it's more just a reflection of the work that we are trying to advance um, and all, all with you to sort of increasing impact. Thank you so much, Rodney, um, and also Benoit. Um, I do think, uh, just reflecting on what you're both saying, there is a bit of commonality there. Um, I don't think anyone uh, within OPSI or within government um, thinks that innovation is automatically mainstreamed or is automatically the de facto way of operating. Um, but I guess it is true to say that it is uh, in its, in its uh, adolescence or in, in evolution, and certainly a declaration is a way of kind of cohering some language around this, putting a line in the sand of what we think could be key drivers. So um, it, it's been, it, I, I appreciate the, the frankness of both of you to be able to speak to that. Um, so uh, thank you both. Um, I think I'll now turn to my colleague, Alex Roberts, who can, give some background um, on the thinking underpinning um, the declaration that OPSI and here at the OECD have, uh, has drafted. So I will shift the camera this way um, to have him in view. Um, so the floor is now Alex's and uh, please feel free to type questions as, uh, as he speaks and we'll answer them at the end. Hi everyone. Uh, so I, I think it's important to, to just pick up on a couple of the points that Benoit and, and Rodney made. Um, one that, yes, it, this is about trying to bring us together. The, one of the key things about innovation is that the fact is that innovation is always contextual. What's new uh, depends on, on the context. And innovation inherently pushes uh, activity and patterns of uh, behavior down more and more segmented and contextual patterns. So innovation in some ways pulls us apart because we're, we're all trying to do what fits our situation best. So this declaration is about helping trying to bring us all together in some way. And it's also about signifying that, that innovation does matter. Everyone has busy agendas. Everyone has priorities that they have to achieve. It's about helping to signal that innovation is about uh, a part of how we do things. It's not just something on top of or in addition to uh, what we're doing. Now, this declaration is an attempt to, to uh, come to some common agreement at the international level. Um, and it's important to recognize that it's been based heavily on our work with countries. This has come out of the, the things that we have learned with and from countries, uh, including uh, some, some detailed work that we did with the Public Service of Canada in a innovation public sector innovation system uh, study there. The other thing to note is that, you know, innovation is obviously important. We think it's important. It's a key part of how we're, uh, governments can address modern challenges and, uh, and context, but it's not the be all and end all. Um, it's not going to be the most appropriate choice all the time. There are going to be times when innovation isn't wanted or needed. But it's increasingly important to pay specific attention to innovation. One of the things we need to recognize is that, of course, innovation has always occurred in government. Uh, governments have always innovated, but the rate at which they've done it doesn't necessarily uh, match the current need. So how can we embed innovation as a more systemic activity across government? Well, one of the ways we can do that is to have a more sophisticated conversation about innovation. One of the challenges that we have with the word innovation is it's one little word to uh, cover so many different concepts and, and ideas. So what we're trying to do is um, build a, a more accessible language around innovation. And part of that is unpacking the word. What does it mean? And recognizing that innovation is in fact multifaceted, that there are different forms of innovation. 
that have to be appreciated and supported in different ways. So we've introduced uh, the language of innovation facets, which are incorporated in this, uh, in the, um, the thinking underlying this declaration. Um, and we've written about it on our uh, website. And it's, uh, we talk about, you know, the need for enhancement oriented innovation, uh, where you're, you're trying to improve the things that are already being done. Mission oriented innovation, where you're trying to achieve big audacious goals. Adaptive innovation, where you're trying to respond to a changing world and anticipatory innovation, where you're trying to engage with weak signals early on before there's a lock-in and government can shape change rather than just react to it. Um, and with each of these, you know, for any, any government to be effective must maintain a portfolio. It must hedge its bets effectively. It's got to make sure that it's got innovation happening across those facets um, so that it can be ready to respond to challenges when and as they arise. Because that's the nature of innovation, is that it's an unpredictable beast. And we don't know when innovation is necessarily going to be needed. Um, and we don't know where innovation is going to go. So we have to have a, a portfolio approach. Um, and that's really what un underlies this declaration, is an attempt to codify some of that language, to start to tell a richer story about why innovation matters, uh, why governments are supporting it and thinking this is important, how public servants can play a role, and the fact that all public servants can play a role. Um, it's not just for some special public servants off in a, in a lab somewhere. Everyone plays a role in this, whether it's as an innovator, as a recipient of innovation, or as just someone who stands by and says, oh yeah, that's a good idea, rather than just going, no, we can't do that. It's about trying to mature that conversation. And so in the declaration, we talk about some, some key sorts of things that we need to embrace and enhance the innovation that's already occurring within the public sector, recognizing that everyone has a role to play and that if everyone has a role to play, then they need to be equipped to play that role. And that we need to have new partnerships and involve diverse perspectives. And that all of this is uh, something that we're learning as we're going. Innovation doesn't have a set recipe. It's something that's a continually evolving practice. And so we need to learn and share for, with each other. Um, so I'm going to hand back to Rebecca. But the key thing with this is, are we telling a, a useful story? And is this something that public servants will find valuable when governments, when and if governments sign on in, a, in some form? Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, I'm just going to have a quick look at the questions we've received to see if we can answer them now or perhaps at the end. Um, okay, these are more comments than questions. So perhaps what I will do now is to um, talk through some of the kind of responses um, we're really seeking from people during this public consultation process. Um, we've had the public consultation process opened since November last year when we launched the draft declaration at our OPSI conference in Paris and it concludes on the 22nd of February this year, so not, not too far away. Um, and we've received um, a bunch of responses so far and it's possible for you to respond either as an individual or on behalf of your organisation or um, as a particular group or on behalf of your country in general. We're, we're open to any particular way um, that suits you to give feedback. Um, and I'll just talk through some of the kind of contributions that we would find really useful as we look to iterate the, the document. Um, so we, we really want you to tell us what does or does not make sense. Um, tell us if the directives that we've put in the structure of the declaration make sense or if they need to be worded differently. And underneath the directives, we've proposed a suite of possible actions. Um, so some of them might be immediately understood or some could be finessed a little bit further to make more sense. So we're open to you just telling us this does not make sense to us. Um, so for example of this, um, I was looking through some of the responses this morning just to see if I could illustrate what I want to say. And um, somebody picked up on the use of our, the, 
our use of the term weak signals. Um, this did not make sense to them and they told us in their feedback during the public consultation. And I think, you know, us at OPSI, um, certainly Alex and um, Perrette, our other colleague, they're very much steeped in the kind of uh, strategic foresight literature where this term is used a lot. Um, but sometimes when we're writing, we, we assume that this term means the same thing to us as it does to other people. So we hope for you to point out something like as this person did that it just doesn't make sense or it needs to be explained further or perhaps it could be footnoted or perhaps something could be used that's a bit more plain English or high level. Um, we're also really open to uh, language suggestions. Um, perhaps we're using terminology you don't know, like in the strategic foresight example, or perhaps we're using words that mean something different in your cultural context. Um, so we're open for you to tell us that as well. So an example of that, um, here at OPSI, we have a lot of um, Canadians, Americans, Australians, Estonians, and Italians in our team. And we all sort of use the word public servant or civil servant fairly interchangeably in our work. Um, we very rarely say government worker, although sometimes we use that as well. Um, so I think throughout this document, we've peppered it with um, civil servant, but somebody from Ireland in their feedback during the public consultation told us that that term doesn't mean what we think it means to them because civil servants are uh, a smaller percentage of their workforce, whereas public servants tend to be the main thing and it's about some legal distinction with who gets funded out of what kind of funding envelope from the exchequer. So that's kind of cultural context that's really useful for us and it's a good prompt for us to reconsider the language we're using so that it can make sense to the widest amount of people. Um, what would be another example? Um, we're really open for you to tell us if the proposed actions or activities are something that could um, be useful or utterly impossible in your context. Um, and even though that even though the declaration is not meant to dictate any kind of implementation, um, that's something that has to be contextually relevant to countries should this document progress and be ratified and be used by countries. However, we are quite interested in hearing about any of the possible um, implications that it might have, uh, a certain activity or a certain directive might have in your country context. Um, one example of this, um, when I was looking through the comments we've received so far in the public consultation, um, this person said they really liked our emphasis on experimentation um, and the idea that we have to learn from failure when we're engaging in innovative practice. However, they said uh, in the final document, it would be really useful to stress that the failure is part of an experimentation and experimentation is a discrete or distinct activity government can undertake because for auditing purposes, you can't just have a, a failure on the books. It needs to be failure in the context of a specific um, activity that's part of a specific program, for example. So that's a level of nuance um, that we need to be made aware of when we're writing so that uh, perhaps it changes the language we use or perhaps it helps us understand how governments could use this down the track. And it's just really useful feedback for us to understand the implications, even if we're not trying to uh, shape them in any way or form through this process. So yeah, I guess to sum, sum up what I'm saying is we really welcome feedback from anyone and everyone who works in government or works um, alongside government um, from the community, from academia. Um, if these ideas are important to you, we definitely want to hear from you. And um, at this point, uh, our purpose is to really iterate the draft and make it the best and um, strongest it can be um, in the next phase. And then from that, um, it'll be proposed uh, to our, within the OECD, to the Public Governance Committee, and from there we'll, it will receive further consideration from those people. Um, so if there's any questions about um, that, I can take them now. Um, let me just have a look. Did you have anything to add to this, Alex? Okay. okay. Uh, there's a question about uh, what this means for different levels of government. Obviously, the OECD primarily uh, works with and interacts and liaises with national governments. 
but uh, we're also interested in the perspective of local governments um, and local innovation ecosystems. Um, so f please feel free to include your comments. Uh, it's also important because innovation is something that has to be considered from an ecosystem perspective. No one uh, level of government, no one body within government is going to be able to successfully address all of these issues or uh, successfully innovate without considering that broader ecosystem. So we need to remember that everyone can play a role and that different governments have very different uh, emphasis. Uh, some will have a lot more uh, decentralization down to local and state governments and therefore they play a, a much bigger role in the innovation system than other governments where the national government might be the, the central focus. Um, and while it might not be official, uh, local governments and local bodies can affirm their commitment or support to this declaration on their own. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to have official standing but it can be an important signal to uh, your stakeholders and your ecosystem that this is something that you're behind and that you support as well. Thank you, Alex. Um, just having a quick look at some other questions we've received here. Um, somebody has asked, uh, what are the next steps after the public consultation process and what sort of obligations or rights uh, countries might have if they sign on to it. So uh, the first thing I should say is that the declaration, uh, we hope it to be an official um, OECD instrument, um, but it's not a legally binding one. So that means that the member countries of the OECD can affirm their commitment to the ideals of it, but they're not necessarily going to be uh, measured on it in the way that um, other OECD instruments require them to, to be measured. Um, in terms of the obligations or the rights, um, what it would mean for a country to sign on to this, it was, it's basically a good way to signal the importance of innovation in the way that their government works and to draw from the declaration uh, good ideas, good possible actions, good directives that can inform their innovation strategies. So if we think that um, uh, governments would be wise to take a portfolio approach to innovation to make sure that they're hedging their bets, as Alex said, um, to cover all possible kinds of innovation for all possible kinds of challenges, then the declaration is a really good place to start where they can start thinking about how to put together a portfolio and to maintain one uh, now and into the future. So I think that would be our ultimate aim for people who sign on to this, um, to, to use it to inspire their uh, uh, the management of diverse innovation strategies and to reflect a bit more deeply on how their system is set up or perhaps not set up to support innovation. Um, so I think hopefully that answers that question. Um, is there any other sorts of questions I should take or is there any other comments from Benoit Rodney um, with regard to this? No, you're good. Um, did you want to answer this one from sorry <laughs> uh, so there's a question about uh, citizen participation um, and uh, and the declaration and public sector innovation I uh, one of the parts in the declaration is where we talk about uh, the involvement of new partnerships and diverse perspectives innovation is uh, it, it relies on understanding different perspectives. Um, so citizen participation is, in our minds, a crucial part of an effective public sector innovation process. And we encourage governments to think about how they can uh, either seek or listen to different voices. Um, and there, we see many different governments doing uh, that in different ways. And at the moment, we're working with our open government colleagues on a call for innovations around open government that demonstrate uh, different ways that citizens can be engaged with. Um, so uh, yeah, citizen participation is, a, is an essential part of effective innovation. Um, and we've tried to reflect that within uh, the declaration. But if, if you think it needs to be reflected, reflected more, uh, let us know. I'll just hand back. Okay, um, 
I think that's all for now because I can't see any more questions coming through on our webinar chat. Oh, wait, hang on. <laughs> Please bear with me while I read this. Um, All right, so we have a question from Louise uh, asking what kind of consultation has been done around the mindset of leadership needed to successfully move uh, to develop an innovation portfolio in government. Um, and then the second part to her question is what research on the knowledge, skills and behaviours needed to, um, that the, the government needs to develop in order to make innovation a reality. Um, these are really great questions and they definitely allow us to speak to um, some of our important work um, that we do at OPSI. So I think Alex would be best placed to kind of reflect on this. So I'm just going to very gracefully turn the camera this way. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we have been doing some work uh, on uh, leadership and skills for innovation um, in partnership with another part of the OECD where we've been looking in country around what are the, the leadership mindsets and skills required to really develop an innovation competency and capability within organizations. And that's some ongoing work and uh, there'll be various publications out about that this year from our website. Um, and we've also been looking at particular innovation skills and uh, what's needed at different stages of the innovation process. Because different forms of leadership are required from when you're really trying to understand the problem and engage with the ecosystem to, to know what is it that we're actually trying to solve or why is innovation needed to say when it comes down to implementing um, and making the innovation stick. Uh, those are, are different skills um, and require different mindsets sometimes. And that's not always possible within the one person. You need, again, an ecosystem. You need diverse uh, players to, to be involved in the innovation process because each can add something at different stages. Um, so in short, it's a, a work in progress. It's something that we know we need to learn more about. Um, but it, it's still something we're, we're still trying to understand. Did you want to comment? Uh, uh, it's nice to note there's a comment from Juan Felipe that from their experience, uh, this kind of declaration can also reach local government levels. Uh, so that's very good to hear. Um, and we hope that uh, our member countries, if they do uh, uh, affirm this declaration, will be using it to engage with other levels of government. Great. Um, so I thought I could conclude the webinar by just talking about next steps. Um, so as everyone knows, hopefully, um, public consultation closes on the 22nd. So we're really hoping to receive your substantive comments um, by that deadline. Uh, we'll close at you know, midnight Paris time on the 22nd. Um, from after, after this webinar, what I'm going to do is to summarize my advice or handy hints guidance about what kind of contributions we're really seeking in the form of a short blog. And I'll also include links to the Canadian Declaration and the French Manifesto because people expressed an interest in um, learning a little bit more about those particular texts. And um, we're really happy to receive any questions, um, either directly or via our uh, opsi at oecd.org email about um, how you can best engage with the declaration and what the next steps might be if you need a bit more of a detailed explanation around that. Um, but yeah, the thing we really just wanted to impress upon everyone is that we are really looking for genuine feedback. We really want to make sure that it's a useful document to you. So. Um, please don't be too polite in your um, feedback where we welcome anything and everything. So um, I just want to thank our co-panelists, uh, Benoit from France and Rodney from Canada and my colleague Alex as well for joining us. And yeah, we're happy. Wave. Okay. I <laughs> um, just want to thank everyone for taking the time to listen to us today. Um, have a great afternoon. And uh, that concludes the webinar for today. Thank you.